Hi, and welcome to our video on the regulation of cell division. In the first video in this unit, we discussed the overall regulatory logic in biological systems. Over the next series of videos, we're going to look at how that regulation plays out at different levels of organization, starting with at the level of cells and moving through to the level of the organism. Cell division seemed like a great place to begin. The question that we're going to be answering here is how is cell division regulated? And in case we need a reminder, it's incredibly important for living systems to be able to regulate cell division, particularly if they're multicellular. Unregulated cell division has a name, it's what we call cancer, and you can see it in this image as the big yellow mass or this tumor in this lung cancer patient. In this video, we're going to talk about the control of cell division and how that's accomplished, and we're gonna look at two particular types of genes. We're gonna look at proto-oncogenes and how they function in the cell, and then we're gonna look at tumor suppressors and how they function. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit about cancer, where cancer comes from, and why cancer happens. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the cell cycle. As cells progress through the cell cycle, they hit a series of checkpoints. Those checkpoints are controlled through the action of particular proteins. In other words, the cell cycle is a protein-based regulatory network. In order to move between the different checkpoints, which I've shown here in green, Particular proteins have to be present, sending signals that allow the cell to progress. Additionally, other proteins that would be preventing the cell from progressing have to not be present. The vast majority of cells in our body are actually never going to divide again. They're no longer moving through the cell cycle. They're stuck in a permanent non-dividing state, which we call G0. It's a permanent interphase. In order to understand how these checkpoints work and how the proteins that are involved in them interact to allow the cell to move through the cell cycle, let's look at the group of proteins that are referred to as the cyclins. Here we see a graph of four different cyclin proteins, cyclins A, B, D, and E, and their concentrations in the cell at different points in the cell cycle. You can see that each cyclin has a different concentration profile at different points in the cycle. A large concentration of cyclin E, for instance, is necessary for a cell to move from G1 into S phase. Cyclin D seems to have a more broad profile. The interactions of these different cyclin protein molecules are connected to the progression of the cell through the cell cycle. That's what we mean when we say that the cell cycle is a protein-based regulatory network. Leaving the cyclins behind, we can look at examples of positive regulation and negative regulation in the cell cycle as well. This is an example of positive regulation. In other words, proto-oncogenes stimulate cell division. The example proto-oncogene that I've shown you here is the RAS protein. There's a family of RAS proteins that interact with other proteins inside of the cell that lead to a signaling cascade that allow the cell to progress through the different stages of the cell cycle and to eventually divide. In order for the cell to divide, these proteins need to be present inside of the cell. On the opposite end of things, we have tumor suppressors. Tumor suppressors have a negative regulatory effect on the cell cycle. In other words, they repress cell division. The example that I'm showing you here is P53. The P53 protein is involved in repressing the expression of a series of other genes that are all involved in progressing the cell through the cell cycle. If P53 is active inside of a cell, the cell will not move through the cycle and it will not divide. It's also important to understand that there are external controls that are functioning on cells in determining whether or not they can divide or not. In the first video in this unit, we looked at contact inhibition and how signals from neighboring cells generally tell cells that are surrounded by other cells that they should no longer be dividing. Different types of external controls can have different effects on the progression of the cell through the cell cycle. They can have positive effects or negative effects depending upon the particulars of those specific signals. The example that we'll point out here is EGF, or epidermal growth factor. Here you can see how EGF interacts with a receptor on the surface of a eukaryotic cell and how that signal then feeds into the regulatory protein network that you see in this diagram leading to cell division or not, as the case may be. In terms of EGF itself, it has a positive regulatory effect. The epidermal growth factor molecule, shown here in green, will complex with receptors on the surface of the cell 
which will then cause a change in the shape of those receptors and send a response to the next protein in the signal and then the next protein in the signal and so on, which will interact with all of the other proteins inside of the cell and have a positive effect, making it more likely for that particular cell to divide. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you to learn that with a name like epidermal growth factor, it's a protein that increases the likelihood of cell division inside of a cell. Putting all of these things together, we can start to get a handle on where cancer comes from. And the first thing that we should really understand is that cancer requires multiple mutations in multiple different regulatory proteins in order to occur. For example, mutations in the proto-oncogene RAS that cause it to become hyperactive and send the signal to divide even when the cell shouldn't be dividing are frequently found in cancer cells. They're found in 16% of all human tumors that are analyzed, and they're found in up to 90% of pancreatic cancer tumors. Similarly, p53 mutations that cause a decrease in the effect of that tumor suppressor gene are found in something like 50% of all tumors, and found in over 95% of all ovarian cancer tumors that are looked at. The point here is that you need to have multiple different mutations that have multiple different effects on the actions of these proteins in order to take a functional, normally responding cell and turn it into something that starts to divide when it shouldn't. That's why cancer tends to be a disease of older age. The longer you live on Earth, the more likely you'll accumulate the kinds of mutations that have to happen in your DNA in order to lead to the production of these mutant proteins that interact in a way that leads to cancer. That's probably a pretty grim thought, but let's not end there. Let's also point out that because of the complex network of protein interactions that lead to cell division, we also have a tremendous opportunity to target different therapies for cancer. If we can determine what the mutations are in a particular cancerous tumor, we can then use that information to develop specific drug profiles that'll be most effective for that particular cancer. And that's very much where medicine is right now in terms of treating cancer. The blanket approaches of chemotherapy and radiation, which are broad spectrum approaches that aim to just kill off all rapidly dividing cells in the body, are giving way to more targeted therapies as our understanding of genomics and our ability to analyze the mutations in a particular genome increase and become more and more cost effective. We certainly haven't cured cancer yet, but we're getting better and better at treating it as our knowledge of the genome and proteins and the interactions of proteins in cell division increases as well. Thanks so much for watching this video on the control of cell division. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain why cell division needs to be under tight regulatory control. Make sure that you can describe the role of proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressors in regulating cell division. And finally, make sure that you can explain how cancer can result from mutations to the cell cycle control genes and how we can use that information in order to target therapies for different types of cancers. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have here at the end so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.